Hi, I'm back. Um, sorry for yesterday. Um, uh, I actually had to leave and go back to the doctor and get re COVID tested. And, um, I've had this cough and they basically said I have like croup. And so I'm on an inhaler and, and I'm doing way better and back at it. So yesterday, um, those of you online, if you're kind of like, where's the lesson? Um, yesterday I, I kind of had, I came and then I left and we, the, the even the in-person students didn't get any type of, uh, like lesson instructions yesterday. It was basically take your formative assessment and then work on notes if you need to, because I had to kind of unexpectedly leave and go back to the doctor. But, um, we are picking back up today with lesson three and um, in, in, in person learners, we're not getting to the War of the Roses, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about the War of the Roses in this particular video because I just kind of want to go ahead and cover everything that I want to cover about England. Um, lesson three is, is actually pretty big within unit five, um, so it's, I'm going to kind of probably break it down into three different videos. So you'll kind of have, you know, lesson three, video one, lesson three, video two, lesson three, video three, uh, more than likely. So it will, it will be Monday before we really kind of get out of this particular lesson within unit five. But uh, with that being said, first things first, I want you guys to kind of focus in on the map here on the screen. Um, you know, this is a map of medieval Europe from 950 to 1300. And if you'll look, there are now things that should look kind of familiar to you um, that maybe uh, on previous maps, you know, you haven't really seen uh, in my class. You know, it's either been Rome or it's been tribal or it's been, you know, the Carolingian Empire under Charlemagne. Uh, and, you know, areas around that are also still tribal here and there. But now, you're, you know, if you look at this map, you're starting to see political boundaries that are England, France, the Holy Roman Empire. I know Spain is still Castile and Aragon, but that, of course, will be united under Isabella and Ferdinand and, of course, becomes Spain. You have Portugal, um, you know, Scotland, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Poland. You know, there, there are some things that you, you know, are starting to see that, that, are still there to this day. So um, anyways, uh, you know, the Carolingian Empire or Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire, of course, took up not just what you see in green there on the map, but also what you see as France. But if you'll remember, his three grandsons split it into three empires. Well, basically, the grandson that controlled the land in the middle wasn't very strong. He was pretty weak. And the other two were able to conquer that land. And there are some maps that show um, this as the West Frankish kingdom and the East Frankish kingdom. But what I want you to understand is that West Frankish kingdom becomes France. And of course, the East Frankish kingdom is the Holy Roman Empire. And the Holy Roman Empire is going to stick around for a while. Um, I pretty much want you to just consider like in your brain, kind of start thinking of the Holy Roman Empire as Germany in a lot of ways. Um, it's more complicated than that. But I mean, like just, you know, first a simplified purpose in your brain, if you want to, you can think of the Holy Roman Empire as Germany. All right. But so we are going to look at, again, the growth of these European kingdoms. And how they went from, you know, what are kind of some of the main stories uh, within England, within France? What are some of the main conflicts between them uh, during this medieval era prior to them really turning into these superpower nations and kingdoms that we think of? <clears throat> so today we're focusing in on England. Um, so one of the most uh, important moments in English history, of course, is the Norman invasion. Um, so this is going to happen in 1066 at the Battle of Hastings. And William of Normandy, which is behind my head, unfortunately, on the map, but if you pull it up, you can see it. <clears throat> that is that piece of property, that piece of land there on the English Channel <coughs> and in northern France. <coughs> Excuse me. 
<coughs> that they gave the Vikings, the, the French gave the Vikings so that they would stop attacking their villages. And anyways, the, the Vikings had come in and conquered the tribal kingdoms in England of the Angles and the Saxons. And there was kind of this, it's complicated, but there was basically a dispute amongst like England and Normandy as to who, who was like the rightful heir to the throne of England. And William of Normandy felt like he had a legitimate claim. And so what happens is he lands on the coast of England and defeats King Harold at the Battle of Hastings. And this is when the nobles, the Angles, and the Saxons, all of them swear their allegiance to William the Conqueror or William of Normandy. And, um, you know, really England, not only like as an ethnicity, but even English as a language starts to evolve from that moment. Um, so it's, a, it's, again, it's kind of that like almost very like foundational solidifying moment uh, in English history is the Battle of Hastings. Okay, so we're going to fast forward from 1066 to 1154, so almost 100 years, and you have Henry II as king of England. And Henry is all about increasing power for the throne, okay, centralizing it, and, and kind of, you know, trying to really define the powers that he has and, of course, his successors will have. Well, you and I have, have talked about, had this conversation many a times about leaders and, and what's kind of the first thing that they start to do whenever they are trying to solidify power and they are trying to, um, you know, create a very like structured environment in which they can control. And that's a law code. I mean, I mean, we've talked about it with, you know, Hammurabi's code, Rome and the 12 tables. Um, Justinian's code, I mean, like, it, it, there's always, you know, that that's one of the main things that if anybody really wants to, again, kind of create a solid power hold, well, you want everybody on the same page, preferably the page you write. So um, Henry II is going to instill common law in England. So again, that everybody is under this same umbrella that he controls. Now, the next thing that Henry does that's very famous is he kind of picks a fight with the Roman Catholic Church. Now, if you'll remember in that social pyramid of feudalism, who is at the top? The Pope, not the king. It's the Pope. So Henry doesn't like this. He's like, why in the world does the Pope have more of a say on religious matters in my kingdom than me when he doesn't live here he doesn't understand the culture here so like what why in the world am i having to answer to a man that lives in rome and has nothing to do really with england and why do i have to answer to him why can't i have more of a say so what he does is he begins to petition for some changes well his best friend thomas beckett is the highest priest of England at the time, which is the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so he goes to his best buddy, kind of expecting, you know, like, hey, we're friends, let's let's work this out. And of course, Thomas Beckett and the viewpoint and stance of the church is, is a resounding like, no, we're, you know, we're not going to give you additional religious powers. Like, that's our business, that, that, that's our realm of things. So no. And over the course of about three years or so, Henry is going to like consistently come back and say, okay, well, like, what if, you know, what if you give me this say or this power? And, you know, he's, he's consistently trying to like negotiate and, and the answer every single time from the church is a resounding like, no, we're, we're this is not negotiable. We're not going to work with you. And so he gets highly frustrated, obviously, after three years of just no, 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 no. And um, <laughs> he's, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> he's sitting at his um, table at court. He's had some wine with dinner and he's mad. He's frustrated. And he kind of makes this offhanded comment. And he says, supposedly, you know, this, he says something along the lines of like, who will rid me? of this meddlesome priest. 
and he's talking about Thomas Beckett. Everybody knows that's who he's talking about. Well, again, like he says it as this offhanded, like frustrated comment. He doesn't, he doesn't mean it as like a decree, but four of his knights actually take him at his word and they ride to Canterbury and they approach Thomas Beckett and murder him in Canterbury Cathedral. So you have to think, guys, the murder of a dominant preacher, pastor, priest today inside of a church would be outrageous and scandalous and, you know, kind of create some shockwaves. You can imagine what the murder of the highest priest in the land in medieval England did. I mean, it was, it's, this is the, I mean, that's the reason why it has gone down in history and is, you know, a story that is still very much alive is because it was so shocking to everyone that these knights would kill, you know, the, again, most powerful priest in England inside the church. I mean, it was one of those like (gasps) moments. Well, of course, Henry is like, oh my gosh, this is not what I meant at all. You know, in the court of public opinion was condemning, you know, the knights and Henry. And, you know, luckily, there were enough people at court that were kind of like, yeah, he made that comment, but it was, it was not, it was not some type of formal decree to go kill Thomas Beckett. And so there were enough people that kind of backed up Henry's side of the story because he said it like basically in the middle of dinner, um, you know, to, to a crowd of people that, you know, the, the people kind of let Henry off the hook, so to speak. They didn't necessarily, They blamed the knights much more so than King Henry for Thomas Beckett's murder. But, you know, the Thomas Beckett's murder in the cathedral is one of those stories in English history, like the Alamo is to Texas. Like if you go, if you go ask like an English person on the street, like, hey, what happened to Thomas Beckett? They're going to know, like, they're going to be able to tell you like, oh my gosh, he was murdered in the cathedral. So this is kind of a dated video. Um, but I still would, yeah, I still want you guys to watch it. And it's, it kind of just goes into the story of the murder of Thomas Beckett a little bit more. <laughs> Excuse me. So <clears throat> I've actually been to uh, Canterbury Cathedral in the city of Canterbury in England. It's incredible. And um, it is a medieval, you know, town. You have to actually like walk through uh, you know, the medieval gates, you, if you look up, you know, you actually see the, the, you know, the spiked gate that they can crank, you know, to pull down on you if they want. Um, the, uh, if, if y'all watched the Knight's Tale clip that I showed you in lesson one, that would have been the end of lesson one, uh, you know, it features the Black Prince of Wales in that movie. And I told you, like, he's a legitimate historical figure. Movie's not historically accurate, but he's a real legitimate historical figure. And I saw his tomb. That's him. And you can see his coat of arms and shields on his tomb there on the bottom. Um, Canterbury Cathedral is huge. Uh, if you look at that picture there in the middle of it, those are people down there at the very bottom. I actually tried to get as far back as I could away from it and like was kneeling down in the grass so that I could try to get the best view I could so that, you know, because I was a teacher at the time that I was over there. And I remember thinking like, how in the world can I really create a perspective of how massive this thing is? So I tried to get people in the shot with the cathedral. But um, really cool. And the spot Thomas Beckett was actually murdered you can stand right next to it and they have a candle that they keep lit at all times there. And there's a little plaque that says, you know, basically you're standing in the spot that Thomas Beckett was, was murdered. And so it's a really neat thing to, to kind of be there and stand in a, you know, such a huge monumental historical moment that happened in the 12th century. It's, it's, it was a pretty neat experience, but okay. So moving on to 1215, This is a couple of successors after Henry II, and you have King John, 
and he's awful. Okay, King John is literally like one of the worst English kings ever. And um, it's because he tried to be above the law. Like he, he was enforcing the law on everybody else except himself. And was just, um, you know, just really kind of unfair and cruel and, you know, corrupted. And, and so the nobles of England band together and basically said, enough is enough. <clears throat> We're not going to let you get away with this. And they drafted the Magna Carta or the Great Charter that specifically said, you know, you have to obey the laws just like we do. You know, no king is above the law. And you have to actually, like, listen to your nobles and your vassals. That's part of the feudal contract. Because there, you know, there's a mutual respect that's supposed to be going on here that you are not showing us. And the Magna Carta is a hugely important historical document to world history, guys. This is not just like some document that's only important to English history. Um, the Magna Carta is going to be echoed in our own Declaration of Independence. In fact, if you ever go to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., which is the building where the copy of our Declaration and our Articles of Confederation and Constitution are laid out for you to see, the first document that's in its own little box that you actually see when you walk into that building is a copy of the Magna Carta. There are only three surviving copies of the Magna Carta in existence, and one is at our National Archives because the government of the United States feels like it's that important of a document to us that we wanted one. Um, <clears throat> Again, like it's echoed in our in our in our Declaration of Independence, it's echoed by our founding fathers and their belief that you know government should be limited, and so and this dates back to twelve fifteen. You know, so this this is a hugely important document that that really kind of creates an incredible ripple effect in England and eventually, of course, in the United States. So uh, fast forwarding, though, like about it's 100 or plus years under King Edward the first, you have Parliament that comes into play, which is a representative body that is, yes, like underneath the king. And they create the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So it's this dual housed representative body. Hmm. Sound kind of familiar. I mean, we have the House of Representatives and the Senate. And it's very much modeled after Parliament. Um, and Parliament is going to really kind of define politics in England for years. Uh, and it's going to set them apart in a, in a large way uh, to, compared to the rest of, of Europe and their monarchies. So, And really, it all stems from the Magna Carta. So this is a great little uh, video that just kind of explains in, in even better detail. And it's got great graphics and stuff what the Magna Carta is. And again, like I want you to watch that on your own time. And then finally, uh, the War of the Roses. Now, this is what we didn't get into today. But this is um, an incredible story within English history about two families that believed they had essentially like claim to the throne. It was a the House of Lancaster and the House of York. And it's called the War of the Roses because the uh, houses' symbols were both roses, but one was white and one was red. And so I can't remember, I can't remember which one is which. I want to say that the House of York, the House of York was a white rose. I want to say that the House of Lancaster was a red rose, I think. Um, don't, it could be opposite. Don't, I don't know, 50-50 chance of being right, right? I don't know, I can't remember. <coughs> but <coughs> it's going to be these two families fighting it out over several decades. Um, and it's, it's basically a civil war that ensues in, in England between these two families and their and their thirst for the throne. Um, Henry the seventh, Henry Tudor, is actually going to win um, the the final battle, uh, so to speak. Um, it's the Battle of Bosworth Field. And he is going to win it. And uh, he's a Lancaster and he is going to be the king that creates the Tudor dynasty, which gives us, of course, Henry VIII, 
Bloody Mary, Elizabeth the first. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty major moment in English history again, when Henry the seventh defeats, um, the house of York at the battle of Bosworth field. So there are some incredible, uh, no, they're not documentaries, but they're they're fun to watch, and they're they're somewhat historically accurate. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more drama thrown in there for entertainment's value, but uh, there are some stars television shows. Uh, one's called The White Queen, the other is The White Princess, and then it kind of transitions even further. Now they have The Spanish Princess, which is about um, Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII's marriage, but. Um, they're interesting to watch and they're historical fiction, but uh, again, lots of history laced in there and, and they're fun to watch. And Philippa Gregory, she, she focuses in on this time of history. If you like to read any type of like novels or historical fiction, she's a good one to, to, to read. But um, the war of the roses is very interesting. And again, if any of you watched um, game of Thrones, there is a ton of uh, influence within the Game of Thrones universe. Uh, and it's from the War of the Roses. I mean, like the whole, I mean, even the author of the Game of Thrones. And I, again, like my brain is so scrambled right now. I can't think of his name. Martin. George Martin, George R. Martin, I think that's his name, the author of all of the Game of Thrones novels, he will even tell you that he gained lots of inspiration from the War of the Roses and the drama of uh, the House of Lancaster and the House of York. So this just kind of talks about the comparison there. So enjoy. Again, on your own time. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop for today because I don't want to get into France until tomorrow. So... I will see you guys then and have a good Thursday.